Okay, so I'm very pleased to introduce our second speaker for this afternoon, Professor Uday Kumar, friend and former colleague who currently teaches at the Center of English Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uday has previously taught at the University of Delhi and was a fellow at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Kolkata. His publications include writing the first person literature, history, and autobiography in modern Kerala that was published in 2016, and the Joycean Labyrinth, Repetition, Time, and Tradition in Ulysses. He's also published numerous papers on modern literature and cultural history, especially of Kerala. His recent research is focused on death and contemporary culture, forms of life writing, cultural histories of the body, and idioms of vernacular social thought. I now invite Professor Vay Kumar to make his presentation, Language, Justice, and Minor Forms of Expression. Uday. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ira. And uh, I must also begin by thanking friends and colleagues for organizing this extremely important event of friendship and solidarity. I'm grateful to be part of these uh, conversations in which Hani, will remain our specially honored participant. I wish I could see him in one of these windows on my screen with his inimitable smile and his incisive intelligence, waiting patiently to listen and respond to us. I understand that this event is being recorded for Hani, and I hope very much that he will be back with us very soon, able to listen to this and take these exchanges forward. The relationship between language and problems of justice, the theme of our conference was fundamental to Hani's intellectual and academic concerns. This is especially evident in his more recent work on language policy, where it has taken the form of a meticulous inquiry into the question of equality among languages within contemporary India's constitutional and governmental frame. Hani and I were colleagues in Delhi University's English department uh, for about seven years until 2015. And I, I recall Hani at that time develop a fascinating MPhil course on language policy and linguistic debates in India, which anticipated many of the concerns evident in his publications, as well as in his later seminar course on language ideology, politics, and policy. Now, Hani considered the equality of the rights of various languages as a condition for political equality. This line of thought, as I understand it, is predicated on the conviction that the inhabitation of language is a condition for political participation and access to justice. Hani's active investment, both as a linguist and as an educationist, in ensuring rightful access to language and to education vividly manifests this strong conviction. The profound connection between our linguistic and political life, and perhaps between the ability to inhabit language and the capacity to problematize the experience of social life and thus pose questions of justice is of interest not only to linguists and the discipline of linguistics, it concerns us all. One might even venture to say that critical humanities in our times are distinguished by the sense of an inescapable commitment to the examination and pursuit of this relationship. I am not a linguist, but questions posed by the inheritance and experience of language inescapably trail and confront any inquiry into literature and culture. This is not because literature is written in language and it offers a privileged access to the secrets or the essence or to the structure of language. What the matrix of texts and practices that we have come to call literature perhaps does offer is an arena to stage and interrogate our capacity for language in relation to our capacity for meaningful life and thus for the experiences of justice and injustice. This possibility is not unique to literature. Other cultural practices of making and unmaking meaning also inevitably encounter the dimension of language or what, may, what one may call a language moment in their diverse trajectories. 
the relationship between the capacity of language and the capacity for a distinctly human political life has been at the heart of Western thought since Aristotle. That which makes man the distinguished political animal, according to Aristotle, is logos as distinct from phonics. Logos brings speech and reason together. It is that kind of speech which is able to consider what is beneficial and harmful, what is just and unjust. We can hear a course of this initial moment in Western political thought. In our own times, when we regard language, both as an instrument of dominating power and as a site where political subjectivities, both defined and consenting are forged. Now, I must caution you that uh, I did not really have a research paper to present today. Uh, what I uh, present here are no more than very preliminary reflections on some aspects of the relations between language, justice, and the human subject, which may be of some relevance uh, in our present moment. I apologize for presenting these in this very tentative and premature state. These reflections were prompted by a change that seems to be underway in the norms that govern our public use of language for the pursuit of justice. We are familiar with established genres or expressive forms for making claims for justice. Perhaps the most notable among them is the petition. This form, as we know, has undergone several mutations in the history of modern India from appeals to kings and princely states, to submissions made to British colonial officials, and later to the governments in independent India, coming down to the present day. Claims for justice that we now file before the judiciary are in the form of petitions. At the heart of the petition is the prayer, which presupposes a vertically asymmetric placement of the speaker and the address. The prayer acknowledges this asymmetry and pleads for the intervention of the powerful to redress a grievance or an injury suffered by the speaker who makes this plea in a suppliant stance. It's not surprising that prayer is a central form in most theaters of sovereign power, be they religious or secular. In later decades of colonial rule in India, Parallel to the recession of nakedly sovereign forms of power in favor of governmental structures and processes, the form of the petition also underwent changes. A large number of mass petitions emerged in late 19th century, starting a trend which continues even now in offline and online petitions. These mass petitions incorporated the prayer into an elaborate discursive form, which drew on evidence on facts and figures published by the government or by agencies of repute, and on accounts of longstanding practices and conventions within communities and localities, and made arguments based on comparison and precedent. While its core still comprised the prayer with its rhetoric of submission and appeal, the material body of the petition increasingly took the form of a well-argued demand for justice. The change in the nature of the petition was accompanied by a change in the conception and positioning of the address. The mass petition ostensibly addressed the state, but it increasingly and indirectly addressed the public and the community represented by the petitioners. In place, places like Kerala, the mass petition served as one of the sources of public political speech. The state or the sovereign addressed by the petitioners was no longer placed beyond the domain of reciprocity. In fact, the petition involved an implied articulation, not only of the asymmetry of power, but also of the normative expectations that positions of power entailed. Even when couched in the language of the plea, the petition invoked an obligation on the part of the ruler 
to respect certain norms which were either founded on tradition, which could be real or mythical, or in ideas of justice that the very act of petitioning developed and put forward. Without abandoning the tone of supplication, petitions could contain criticism and even implied threats. Now, this strand of recent argumentation and the marshalling of evidence have remained important for our ideas of a critical public sphere, where discourses are addressed simultaneously to the state and to other citizens. The conception of critical speech cannot be entirely separated from the apprenticeship of the modern citizen in democratic states, where education aims at the inculcation not only of knowledge, but also of skills of critical thinking. In independent India, modern education was described by the state as a vital force for freeing the citizen from superstition and the oppressive aspects of tradition and for cultivating individual and collective selfhood. The principle of criticism, however, possesses a contrary trajectory too, where it sees itself as autonomous from the state. In fact, the critical principle in modern times defines itself precisely in its refusal to accept the state as the ultimate arbiter in matters of truth or matters of belief. We know that recent argumentation or the discursive validation of claims in a debate that is protected from the disruptive play of forces is not the form that the public practice of criticism frequently takes in modern democracies. A few minutes ago, uh, Nivedita invoked the work of Jacques Rancier, who once described democracy as the rule of those who are not qualified to. By this, he meant that the demos are defined as those who do not possess any qualification which would make them especially eligible to be rulers. This has crucial implications for the practice of criticism. It is not specialized knowledge or erudition or expertise that defines the spirit of modern public criticism. The entitlement of the critic derives from being governed, being the object of the application of political power. We often see a tussle between a rational analytical idiom and a more passionate, forceful register in public criticism. And often the two uh, are mixed together and become difficult to separate as well. Even as both these strands draw on facts and advance arguments, they arguably seem to conceive the nature of political subjectivity they address somewhat different. While the first prioritizes an individual rational capacity for political judgment, the second invokes a more spontaneous and instinctive capacity for moral response. Both these registers of public criticism are facing enormous challenges in our times. External constraints placed on criticism are all too evident before us. Hani's long under trial imprisonment is a clear example of this. Hani's writings and interventions, be they regarding the implementation of reservations for students from underprivileged backgrounds in universities, the unjust and inhuman treatment of a disabled colleague in prison, or language policy, have been exemplary instances of public criticism. Interestingly, Hani's critical interventions invoked and adhered to the principle of the Constitution and were aimed at making the state and its promises work. Incarceration is the most explicit instance of the repression of public criticism, since it removes the body of the critic from the public arena. And this removal is carried out through a procedure which is anything but explicit or transparent. Other equally onerous forms of coercion work by physical intimidation or the threat of material or economic harm. These attacks on individual practices of criticism have been paralleled in recent times by a serious curtailment of the right to public assembly. Even before the COVID pandemic, 
licensed many autocratic states to prohibit all public assembly. An increasing number of restrictions were already in force against free assembly and peaceful protest. We could see a growing vilification of peaceful protests, which painted them as engineered by external vested interests or as violent or disruptive in intent or both. The fascination of the contemporary middle and upper classes with a strong state and their growing devaluation of democracy have endorsed the external deactivation of public assembly and protest as part of a desirable new normal. The prohibition of public assembly is tantamount to disabling the pursuit of justice through speech and public demonstration. Practices of criticism have been disabled at the same time, perhaps even more deeply by what one may call a process of internal corrosion. This is caused by the proliferation of discourses that mimic the idioms and gestures of public criticism and undermine their relationship to truth and the pursuit of justice. This has been evident in two discursive moves through which criticism has been countered by the establishment, be that the government or the ruling dispensation. The first involves the undermining of the truth claims on which pleas of justice are based. This is accomplished through the production of confusing or contradictory narratives as evidence. The force of the truth claim is particularly strong, as we know, in the case of testimonies, of which the suicide notes written in context of refusal and protest are perhaps the most extreme instance. A challenge before critical thought now is how to recognize the complex nature of sovereignty and agency manifested in political suicides and their thematization of injustice. The truth claims of testimonies have an added force as the speaker bears witness to the truth of the utterance by staking his or her body and life. These extreme truth claims, countersigned by death, have in recent times been countered by strategies of debunking, aimed at a relativization of claims and a trivialization of all testimonies. Several parallel counter narratives are produced and circulated which crowd out the possibility of any close and reliable public examination of evidence. The immediate goal of the strategy of obfuscation is to defeat and silence the critic. This does not, of course, mean that criticism has been satisfactorily answered. It means rather that the practices of reception necessary for the work of criticism have been rendered inoperative. One may say that public criticism is made possible by a posited connection between utterances and what we may uh, somewhat uh, generally or expansively call a problematic of truth. I'm aware of the difficulties that surround the use of a concept such as truth and do not at all wish to suggest any easy or privileged access to truth on the part of the critic. What I have in mind is a certain orientation of the subject in relation to utterance that lies at the heart of public criticism and public, public pleas of justice. Without the idea of staking oneself and risking oneself in relation to one's utterance, it is difficult to conceive of public practices of criticism in the pursuit of justice. The vital link between utterance and truth that undergirds critical practice is the principal target of the counterattacks that I mentioned above. A striking feature of these strategies is their indifference to establishing truth or putting contesting truth claims to test. Sometimes, the seeming falsity of counterclaims may even add to their effectiveness, as it can serve as a demonstration of the chilling effectiveness of a power 
that is invulnerable to the binding claims of truth. Like you do not even care if you appear, if your stories or counter narratives appear uh, as false, even then you persist with them, uh, uh, showing that you do not really uh, mind people leveling criticisms about its veracity. Now in Malayalam, uh, an older way of denoting the binding character of truth uh, is found in a phrase which will translate as uh, the fear of truth. Now, this idea of the fear of truth is a bit similar to uh, the, the phrase like fear of God, uh, which refers to a superior, which refers to the superior and sovereign claims of truth to which one must submit in speech. Such phrases indirectly, of course, go on a long and somber history of truth game centered on the body, pain, and death, like, for example, truth games like the audience. The link between utterance and truth may be seen as preceding here, the level where the truth values of propositions are determined through analysis and argumentation. The injunction against false testimony, as we know, precedes and serves as the precondition of the testimony. The contemporary erosion in the orientation to truth may therefore need to be considered as taking place at this anterior level before the co competition between propositions and their respective truth claims. Arguably, this comes logically prior to the moment when one regards language as a system of signs whose acquisition typically enables one to lie. Now, now this is, as, as many of you would know, this is the way uh, Umberto Eco characterized the distinctiveness of language as a system of science and what it enables. There are speech genres which foreground the strong affective link between utterances, truths, and the subject. The oath, the pledge, and the vow are forms of this kind. In each of them, the subject performs an act that is tied that ties into the utterance. The sovereignty of the subject is simultaneously affirmed and annulled in this act. Like for example, the person who takes a vow affirms uh, his or her sovereignty in the act of taking the vow, but the vow is also binding and it reduces the sovereignty of the subject in relations to future possibilities of action. The utterance is no longer used as an expressive resource by the speaker, but rather as an event over which she as subject does not possess sovereign control. The attenuation of the powers of the individual as the originator of the speech event can also be found in uh, public assembly. The assembly is a form of public critical practice where language and the physical assembly of bodies are often conjoined with one another. The political slogan is a form of articulation that belongs to the public assembly. The slogan is not only a text that needs to be read or heard being read, but essentially and primarily, it is an utterance that demands to be performed with voice and bodily participation. Even in silence or in writing, the slogan retains an element of this performative dimension. Now, English dictionaries will tell us that the word, the English word slogan comes from uh, the early 16th century from two Gaelic words uh, for army and shout. This etymology accounts for the sense of the war cry that the word possesses in many contexts, signifying an invocation that is meant to energize the collective engaged in battle. Shouting a slogan fuses the individuals together into a group, each individual voice merging into those of the others. In Malayalam, the word for the slogan is mudravakya, which may loosely be translated as signet phrase or stamp phrase, expressions that live in the neighborhood of the watchword. I do not quite know when or under what circumstances this word came into circulation in Malayalam. It is probably sometime in the first half of the 20th century, but I'm not sure.
The Malayalam word Mudravakim carries the sense that the slogan serves as a collective signature, as a distinguishing sign, perhaps alongside the idea that each individual is stamped by the utterance she shouts aloud. Even if some of us might find this latter suggestion about being stamped by the utterance somewhat far-fetched, we would agree that the slogan is a performative that repeatedly enacts and reaffirms the dynamic institution of the collective in the course of action. Slogan's voice demands as well as statements of rejection or refusal, but many of them have the form of expression of a wish in the subjunctive mood or a command that would bring a desired state into existence had won the power. Victory to the revolution, long live the republic, such slogans in their mood have an interesting proximity to prayer, a crucial difference being that it is being addressed not to an external source of authority, but to the very collective that utters it. This self-address nonetheless invokes something beyond it in the nature of the dynamic power of action that unites the collective and unfolds through it into the future. The power of the slogan is grounded in the intensity of the allegiance that unites individuals in a collective. The slogan in this sense is the signature of a primary allegiance, which needs to be reinscribed repeatedly. This allegiance, I suggest, occupies the plane of that primary orientation we explored in the context of our earlier comments on truth. We see this strikingly when political prisoners shout slogans, even if they are alone, even when led to the gallows to be executed, thus affirming their defi defiant allegiance to a cause and to a collectivity. When uh, Bilas Gokre committed suicide in protest against police atrocities in Mumbai in the late 90s, it was a slogan that he chose as his suicide inscription. The status of slogans as signals indicating the truth of allegiance may explain the violent counter move, which we are familiar with in recent times, of forcing people to chant certain, certain slogans against their will. The victim may find some of these slogans reprehensible or she may be indifferent to them. But regardless of one's appraisal of the content of the slogan, the victim may find herself humiliated and violated by this act of coercion. At issue here is the effective orientation of the subject in relation to utterances. The slogan is a salient instance of this insofar as it is a signet statement through which one exposes oneself in the public domain. Coercing people to chant slogans is saying that weakening the force of utterance as special signs of authenticity and, as sites, and thus as sites of veridiction. Such denial of self-veridiction in the use of speech finds its apogee in the activity of trolling. This is at least three act, uh, aspects which may merit our consideration. The first, which has received much public attention, concerns the organized production and circulation of verbal and visual representations these goals and the process through which the representation was produced and circulated are deliberately concealed in order to achieve specific political ends. The second aspect relates to the individual, the troller, for whom trolling becomes a deliberate and passionate political practice. Since it sets aside questions of truth in favor of silencing one's opponents in the social media, this is important consequences for defining one's relationship to language. It would be interesting to inquire what sort of self-practice is constituted by trolling. Thirdly, the overall effect of trolling as a practice is not about getting one narrative established at the expense of another, but to make their comparison and evaluation impossible. The practice of the critique against which trolls are directed is derailed even before it can take off. The critic is prevented from moving forward as further engagement will mire her even more deeply and inextricably in the welter of narratives. 
It is important to note here that what has been developed in practices of trolling is a parody of the gestures of the practice of the critique. The assumption that apparent reality hides something which can only be brought out by analytical excavation, by suspicion, and the adoption of demystification as the main strategy for accessing truth have created an image of the critic as a specialist who is superior to the general public. This is particularly true about academic criticism, as we know. The parody of this is the troll's line, a special take, which trolls are given and asked to aggressively push and circulate on a massive scale. The essential strategy of the line is to treat all arguments as hiding a set of vested interests. Faced with an army of trolls, the language of the critique finds itself increasingly unable to address any public beyond the narrow circle of people who share the same specialist, specialist protocols of language use. Now, there have been attempts to forge resistant forms of expression in public, which do not quite fit into this model. These forms try to reconnect with a more elementary relationship to truth, which I suggested presents itself as anterior to our critical and analytical uses of language. They form part of a larger set of idioms of political expression, which have become probably more visible in recent times. Unlike the more mainstream forms of resistant action, these appear less energetic and at times even passive. Silent sit-ins and the perilous occupation of public spaces, rituals of mourning and lamentation in relation to unjust deaths or disappearances, and the public visibilization of injuries and vulnerability in themselves, that is, without the supplement of any goal-oriented program of action for which there would be particular strategies, have increasingly appeared in public as forms of protest and resistance. While these forms may not have an exclusive or specific relationship to language, their public claims touch upon the plane of the subject's primary orientation to truth, which I referred to earlier. The demonstration of oneself in situations of injury, fragility, and vulnerability constitutes the principal uh, act of political resistance here. More than statement, dialogue, or communication, it is the naked visibilization of a state of existence that becomes manifest in these forms of political response. In this, one may find an attitude of quiet resoluteness, which is different both from resignation and defeat, and also from idioms of energetic and confident resistance. There is a refusal to play the language game of agonistic debate, which has been damaged by the toothless inflation of speech about which I spoke a moment ago. Test testamentary forms have acquired a particular salience here. Even when they adopt narrative forms, even when they tell stories, at their core, we find situations of configurations of the subject that are not amenable to narrative unfolding or consolidation. Intense emotional experiences that pose problems for coherent subjectivity, such as humiliation, shame, grief, or debilitating injury are of this kind. It is difficult to account for their resistant power in relation to the familiar conception of agency, which links agency to actions originating within an autonomous subject. I have referred to these less visible forms of resistance tentatively in the title of this talk, as minor forms, partly in reference to Deleuze's conception of the disruptive power of minor literature, but equally or even more so as an allusion to the passage in Kafka's letter from where Deleuze borrowed the phrase. The word Kafka used was klein, which means small or little. 
the forms I drew attention to are less visible and audible, and even more importantly, less legible than mainstream forms of protest, which seek to demonstrate our capacity for countervailing action against power. Nonetheless, these forms press upon our attention in the present, both diagnostically, revealing the circuit board of contemporary power, which has spawned them, and by their presencing of figures of political subjectivity for whose analysis we probably need to develop more adequate tools. My interest in these forms is also related to the nature of the collectives they seem to give rise to. We may be in the presence of a notion of solidarity based less on deliberation or consensus than on shared vulnerability and an effective opening to others. We know that the idea of solidarity is based on a notion of equality. We are also familiar with the limits of a quantitative notion of equality, which works at the expense of singularities. The solidarities indicated by these minor forms may also be different from certain prominent ethical idioms of equality, which take a vertical uh, conception of respect as their precondition. A different idea of togetherness may be at work here, based on a shared sense of destitution and fragility. Here, I use the word destitution in the sense in which Aniket Javre used it in his profound and provocative book, Practicing Caste, where it is placed in opposition to institution which in turn is linked to statute, which means law, regulation, which is derived from the Latin verb stare, which means to stand. Destitution involves a privation of this erection or standing and a beginning with hardly anything by way of attributes to serve as a robust base for collective identity. Instead, shared fragility and exposure indicate the grounds of togetherness here. The sense of solidarity at work in such forms implies a conception of the human subject that focuses less on clear identities and properties than on what we may call a lower threshold of our existence where affect, utterances, and forms of action are less sharply differentiated. Solidarity here is based not so much on moral appraisal as on the porousness and permeability of the human subject. This becomes a site of quiet resoluteness and refusal. I feel that we may wish to pay more, uh, more and uh, closer attention to these minor forms of expression in action and in language to gain a better understanding of the emerging idioms for the pursuit of justice in our present. Uh, I would like to conclude by expressing my solidarity with Hani Babu and by joining you all in demanding his immediate release from prison. I hope he will return to his intellectual and academic work soon and join these conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you there. Um, thank you. That was um, very engaging, insightful as always, and suggestive on so many levels, you know, the way you talk about the relationship between language and politics. Um, I'm sure there are lots of comments and questions, but I could get the ball rolling. Um, you know, you talk about the disabling of the, you know, the, the practices of public criticism, and, and that was, that took me, you know, got me thinking about um, how voicing of dissent, you know, is it's a big part of acting politically. Um, but increasingly, it's not only not compatible, I mean, it's it's more than compatible, it's actually central to, you know, what Rancière calls post-politics. You know, you there's a staging of this dialogue and, and, um, and, you know, as you say in your paper that, you know, all the gestures of dialogue are followed, but actually accepting the invitation to participate in the dialogue could actually end up amounting to um, participating in your own dispossession, you know, where, um, um, uh, you, you know, you um, dialogue is then, the staging of dialogue is seen as a license to then act unilaterally, 
you know, I mean, you, you've seen, we've seen that over the 17, 18 rounds of talks that the farmers have had over the government. So it, it's, uh, so I was, my, my question was that, um, do, do you think that grassroots activism uh, as a form of acting politically um, has lost that power to bring about change in the way that it would in the past? Or, you know, does form of forms of political action, do they fall to be changed now we, we, when dialogue is co-opted in this manner? Um, yeah, that's my question. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ira, but uh, uh, you are, you know, you're right to pose those questions, but they are so difficult to answer because mm -hmm. I, I'm not really a, a, a political activist or somebody who has thought enough about uh, mm -hmm. the effectiveness of political action. But mm -hmm. like you pointed out, one thing is certain, many of the moves of uh, public criticism that we have been familiar with, uh, in the context of what we have called a liberal democracy are becoming increasingly ineffective and they are increasingly incorporated into uh, uh, a game or a set of games where, which eventually uh, does not uh, serve questions of justice or take us close to posing questions of truth. And uh, this is why I feel that there is there is a need to go beyond or rethink the discursive moves that we can at the moment use to expose power and expose the effects of power. And there, sometimes a certain attitude of humility or modesty in the powers of critical language may be salutary. And uh, what I find uh, very interesting in the uh, kinds of protests or forms of political action which have deliberately adopted a less uh, active uh, or energetic stance, preferring a more passive and quiet kind of posturing mm -hmm. is really this demonstration of the effect of power, the demonstration of a certain condition, which may actually uh, elicit solidarities, which uh, the discursive practice of the critique may not elicit. So yeah. this I find is very important. And what we need to probably think harder about is uh, about what kind of idea of agency or political agency does it really present before us and where can we find the tools for thinking about them. Mm -hmm. Now, I do not want to suggest that we need to make a kind of a binary opposition between the practice of the critique and these kinds of practices, because these are also aimed at a transformation. These are also, uh, uh, these also have aims similar to that of the political critique in their desire to unveil and demonstrate the workings of power, which mm -hmm. now conceal themselves behind uh, the language of uh, uh, discussion, the language of dialogue, and even the language of critique, as in the case of the troll. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what I'm suggesting is that there may be a need to uh, suspend our belief in the effectiveness of the more mainstream languages of criticism and, mm -hmm. talk and listen even more to these new forms of agency which are mm -hmm. manifesting itself in the political domain. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. do, do you think, okay, one, just one come, uh, come back, I was thinking, do you think these new, new forms of agency also recall, say, you know, um, say Gandhian forms of agency, you know, where you retreat and that becomes a way of actually intervening in the world? you know, um, through, through silence, through refusal of food. So, so redefining agency is not outward and externally oriented, um, you know, um, but, but turning inwards and, and uh, you know, um, actually, I mean, a, a new paradigm for agency, really. Yeah, you know, the Gandhi, as, uh, as you know, is a very complex case, you know, in the sense that there are also uh, very strongly developed notions of uh, individual sovereignty with which uh, Gandhi sometimes works mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and interior is all things of that kind. And what I have in mind or what I am most sensitive to in this, uh, in the kind of things which we see around us is not so much that sense of an authentic individual interior autonomous intervention, but mm -hmm. far more a certain kind of connection of standing together even as you are defenseless, or even as you may be physically weak or oppressed, 
there is some way in which you stand together and uh, 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 and where your permeability or fragility holds you together rather than a principle or a decision. But in this, there is a clear sense of resoluteness. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that resoluteness and its workings uh, are probably what we need to understand and uh, find the right tools for uh, bringing to light. And, and I think that would be the task of the critique, mm -hmm. uh, the task of the critique now, I feel. Right, right, thank you. Thank you. So questions from the floor, you know, yeah. people want to ask. Yeah, sure. Uh, Udaya, will you be able to read the questions from the chat box? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, the first yes. one is from Aisha. Aisha. Yes. Uh, the axis you primarily uh, uh, relate to criticism directed amongst the rulers and the ruled, but what about criticism between the ruled, who nevertheless stand together in their criticism of the rulers, even as they are differentiated among each other, often by different hierarchies like caste, gender, religion. What are your thoughts on terms current today, like cancel culture, deplatforming, which I think speaks to the articulation of distinctive truths among the ruled? Are we to see these as the equivalent of rulers' dismissal of others' truth claims? It, it could well be that they are not as effective as the rulers' dismissals, though. What are your thoughts on these forms of expression? No, no this is again a, such, a, such an important and uh, a profound question. And there, you know, I, I have some preliminary thoughts about that. And there, I feel that uh, the, unlike the situation of the rulers and the ruled, where there is, where we increasingly see uh, a deliberate derailing of the pursuit of justice or the pursuit of truth, where you have uh, a strategic, uh, uh, obfuscation of truths by proliferation of discourses. In this contest of truth among the ruled, what we find is not that similar kind of cynical uh, disinvestment in questions of truth. It is more like uh, uh, questions of truth are put forward against each other, but there is a reluctance or there is a, uh, uh, there is a turning away from uh, accepted methods of discursively settling them in terms of a discursive contest. Yeah? That, in other words, there is a, a certain distrust of the idea of dialogue. And this distrust of the idea of dialogue, I see as part of a larger problem, which I was trying to outline. And in this situation, again, I feel that what may, may take us forward is a certain notion of standing with, which is not at the level of analytical discourse, but at the le level of uh, taking oneself in relationship to other struggles, even struggles whose specific forms you may not agree with or you may have problems with, uh, you may actually want to stand with them. And this way of demonstrating a certain standing with, which is not discursive, but which is being there, being part of supporting them, etc that may actually probably be a way to go beyond this, uh, this kind of impasse which is created by uh, uh, a refusal of conversation. What we may need is something which is other than the logic of conversation here. This is the really difficult part. I do not really know what else will come in there. That, that is where I feel that the level of language may be uh, put forward arguments and where we enter into a kind of agonistic debate uh, about the claims we make, that is one level. But anterior to that, there is a prior commitment between, uh, prior relationship between the subject and the utterance. That is the orientation towards truth. These ideas of standing with ICS belonging to that level. What practical forms it takes, I do not really know. It may not be settled through conversation and critical discourse. It may not be settled through the, the logic of criticism, which we have developed probably to an extreme extent in, in, the, uh, in the present. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure I quite answered the question, but it's, uh, that's, that is what I can say at the moment because these are such difficult and important questions. Right? And, and Gita has a, a, a 
come in to a question here. Uh, a thoughtful, beautiful presentation, particularly like the focus on embodied communication in the context of the relationship between politics and language. In the context of state action, this embodiment exists literally, whether it is the narco test, yes, on which Ginny Lopnita has a great book, or the proposed DNA testing protocols that are part of the new bill. But as much in the area of execution, where your words are used to indict you and you are made to indict yourself. There is a great moment in Polanski's film on the Dreyfus trial when he is accused of forgiving his own handwriting, uh, forging his own handwriting. And it is evident that whether he forged his writing or not, he is already accused of untruth. His Jewishness takes care of that and renders the protocols of evidence supplementary to what is already known of the body. Language turns in on itself and in, in its opacity becomes a potent weapon of authority. This is, uh, this is so uh, uh, suggestive and uh, so resonant with many of the things which we are facing in the present moment, where uh, the trial, the form of the trial itself actually becomes in some sense the charade. So uh, the participation in the trial, giving evidence, making arguments itself becomes part of a predetermined structure. So what does the critique do at that time? What can be done is actually to foreground this problem and to find ways in which one can withdraw from that and create other forms of, or try to search for other forms of public intervention, which may not be so much dependent upon the critical discourse and its elaborations. And against the narco test, you have the silent protest and against the DNA model is the disparate forms of solidarity that are held together in a shared sense of vulnerability. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for this. Yeah. Uh, now Satish, uh, yeah, yeah, Satish, uh, uh, I assume Satish Fudua, fascinating point about the Malayalam word Mudravakim slogan as involving a personal seal or signature in public speech. May, may we not also see mudra as a performative and creative gesture of solidarity? The English word slogan originates in a military war cry, the Malayalam word in dance. I, thank you, Satish. I, I do not know about the, uh, uh, the Malayalam word mudravakim, whether it refers to dance, it's a possibility, the, the gestures, the schematized gestures, which are used in uh, 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 certain more systematized forms of dance. But mudra also, we know that it is a word which is deeply implicated in governmental technologies in the history of modern Malayalam, like the sealing something, the activity of sealing something with wax, putting an emblem, a seal on it, that is called mudra vekiga, something which is closed, which cannot be opened without uh, violating or break. It can be opened only by the authorized person who has the right to break the seal, so to say. So there is a connection between, you know, I have always, uh, I have tended to see it as, uh, uh, yeah, exactly, like in the case of mudra patram, like the stamp paper is called mudra patram. And uh, the postage stamp is called Tapal Mudra. In all these are actually stamps of power or stamps of authority. Now, Mudra Vakim, of course, is the stamp of a certain kind of power, a certain kind of collective power, but it is also a stamp of allegiance. Like when you do a, a, a attestation, for instance, you actually do it on a stamp paper, really because uh, uh, the, you are validating, you are presenting your affidavit uh, within a frame where you can be held responsible for that. These are schematized ways of staking oneself in the utterance that one is a signatory to. Now, Mudravakim has something of that kind. What interests me about Mudravakim is that it is not anchored within the individual subject. It has a collective context. Now, sometimes even when this collective context is absent, as in the case of uh, uh, Vilas Vogre, uh, there is a strange pathos in its invocation. And that itself is a demonstration in the sense in which I use the word uh, in, the, in the case of these new practices of public criticism. Uh, Ashwati, 
just want to point out that the two forms of actions that you mentioned, petition and slogan, itself comes from two stratas of resistance groups. The form of from concerned citizens in solidarity, which are majority of the petitioners, and the latter from the ones resisting and demanding justice and reparation. Now, uh, actually, this is interesting. You know, like, I, I feel that this is true about uh, the contemporary situation. A lot, lot of uh, petitions that we sign uh, uh, in support in the, as members of civil society in support of people who are resisting. But uh, we must remember that petition is a much larger form. You know? That is, uh, like if, when you file a case, it is a petition. When you file a uh, uh, request for compensation, that is a petition. So anybody who uh, can actually claim justice, who wants to claim justice from the state, petition is actually the official form, so to say, official here, meaning whether it be in terms of the structures of governance or in terms of the structures of civil society. Now, slogans, as you correctly point out, of course, uh, 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 probably they occupy a place which is outside the ambit of this governmental space. Uh, but uh, I would think that the idea of the petition is uh, much larger and wider. Like uh, Jomi, uh, who uh, is in this uh, group at the moment and uh, who has just submitted a PhD dissertation on the suicide notes, which have been written in the context of, uh, uh, by, uh, by the difficulty, the, the farmers, the farmer suicide notes. Uh, one of the things their analysis reveals is the very close relationship between the form of the suicide note, in many of these instances, and the form of the petition. The petition essentially is a document that foregrounds an injustice and demands reparation. It may ostensibly address the power which can, which is, uh, which has the authority to redress it, but it is also a revelation to the public, an exposure to the public of that responsibility and the uh, effectiveness or ineffectiveness of the redress. So, in that sense, petition probably has a uh, has a longer trajectory, and we also need to think of other forms of prayer and idioms of prayer which have come up in situations of protest, especially by people who are uh, in situations without recourse, legal recourse. Uh, Aisha, again, with respect to the slogan, I wonder whether you would like also to dwell on the call and response structure of the slogan, which maintains the structure of the natural language conversation vis-a-vis -vis the troll whose linguistic act is to use all language violate all Gaussian maxims, unlike the slogan, in case you do that. No, actually, uh, this, is, this is wonderful. This is very interesting because the troll has a, uh, a refusal of uh, uh, an exchange. The idea there is actually to snuff out any possible exchange. Whereas the slogan, the collective nature of the slogan itself is really in the call and the response. And, and, uh, and the idea there is also that the caller may vary. You may take turns calling and you may take turns responding. So, but this is very, very interesting. Thank you very much. And uh, Susie, uh, it's a new step with new resources into our unprecedented time and an attempt to describe the pressing it and familiar interlinks on us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Susie. Yes, thank you very much. That's a comment. Uh, well, are there any questions on the YouTube? Because I don't see any uh, anything more here. But probably we have reached the end of uh, the time we have. Yes, I think. Yeah, I don't think there are any questions on the YouTube. Okay, all right. Yeah, there is one more. Uh... Yeah, we can we can take one more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. To what extent do you think the international protest in the form of a letter, which was recently written by Nobel laureates, academicians, UMPs, and other across the globe for the release of the book, affects the state? You know, uh, I, I can only say no as much as you do about this, you know, but I feel that uh, we need to uh, exert 
all available uh, uh, means of uh, pressuring the state to redress this injustice uh, about pe putting people uh, mm -hmm. without any clearly formulated charges for a year uh, just because uh, they have criticized the government or they have uh, been active in ensuring justice where uh, the implementation of justice was uh, deliberately tardy. Yeah? Uh, so there I feel that the question of international support, uh, solidarities of every possible kind are important. And, and in, the, in the talk, I was speaking about a particular level of solidarity which we need perhaps to pay greater attention to. And, and this conference itself is an imaginative form of solidarity. And in that sense, this conference in its own way is also an attempt to uh, uh, add force to the efforts to get this injustice redressed. Okay, I think we can um, we can close the session now. Thank you, there. That was that was really um, very insightful, and uh, in, you know invites us to think about the moment in which we live today on so many levels. Um, so thank you for that, um, and thanks everybody for your great questions. Um, and now I will hand over um, the chairing back to Aisha, and we have to two more papers to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks Thank again. You. Thank you. So everybody, when we will start, let me just do a brief introduction. We have two speakers today, but I would like